Chapter Six of Strange Pages from Family Papers. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information and to find out how you can volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Strange Pages from Family Papers by T. F. Thistleton Dyer. Chapter Six: Indelible Bloodstains. Will all great Neptune's ocean wash this blood? clean from my hand no this my hand will rather the multitudinous seas incarnadine making the green one red macbeth it was a popular suggestion in olden times that when a person had died a violent death the bloodstains could not be washed away to which macbeth alludes as above after murdering duncan this belief was in a great measure founded on the early tradition that the wounds of a murdered man were supposed to bleed afresh at the approach or touch of the murderer. To such an extent was this notion carried that by the side of the beer, if the slightest change were observable in the eyes, the mouth, feet, or hands of the corpse, the murderer was conjectured to be present, and many an innocent spectator must have suffered death. This practice forms a rich pasture in the imagination of our old writers and their histories and ballads are laboured into pathos by dwelling on this phenomenon. At Blackwell, near Darlington, the murder of one Christopher Simpson is described in a pretty local ballad known as the Baydale Banks Tragedy. A suspected person was committed because when he touched the body at the inquest, upon his handling and moving, the body did bleed at the mouth, nose and ears, and he turned out to be the murderer. Similarly, Macbeth, Act Three, Scene Four. Speaking of the ghost, says, It will have blood. They say blood will have blood. Stones have been known to move and trees to speak. Auguries and understood relations have, by mago pies and chuffs and rooks, brought forth the secrets man of blood. Shakespeare here, in all probability, alludes to some story in which the stones covering the corpse of a murdered man were said to have moved of themselves, and so revealed the secret. In the same way, it was said that where blood had been shed, the marks could not be obliterated, but would continually reappear until justice for the crime had been obtained. On one occasion Nathaniel Hawthorne enjoyed the hospitality of Smithles Hall, Lancashire, and was so impressed with the well-known legend of the bloody footstep that he, in three separate instances, founded fictions upon it. In his romance of Septimus, he gives this graphic account of what he saw. On the threshold of one of the doors of Smithhouse Hall, there is a bloody footstep impressed into the doorstep, and ruddy as if the bloody foot had just trodden there, and it is averred that on a certain night of the year, and at a certain hour of the night, if you go and look at the doorstep, you will see the mark wet with fresh blood. Some have pretended to say that this is but dew, but can dew redden a cambric handkerchief? And this is what the bloody footstep will surely do when the appointed night and hour come round. A local tradition says that the stone bearing the imprint of the mysterious footprint was once removed and cast into a neighbouring wood, but in a short time it had to be restored to its original position, owing to the alarming noises which troubled the neighbourhood. This strange footprint is traditionally said to have been caused by George Marsh, the martyr, stamping his foot to confirm his testimony, and has ever since been shown as the miraculous memorial of the holy man. The story is that being provoked by the taunts and persecutions of his examiner, he stamped with his foot upon a stone, and looking up to heaven, appealed to God for the justice of his cause, and prayed that there might remain in that place a constant memorial of the wickedness and injustice of his enemies. It is also stated that in 1732, a guest sleeping alone in the green chamber at Smithles Hall saw an apparition in the dress of a minister with bands, and a book in his hand, the ghost of Marsh, for so it was pronounced to be, disappeared through the doorway, and on the owner of Smithles hearing the story, he directed that divine service, long discontinued, should be resumed at the hall chapel every Sunday. Then there are the bloodstains on the floor at the outer door of the Queen's apartments in Holyrood Palace, where Rizzio was murdered. Sir Walter Scott has made these blood marks the subject of a jocular passage in his introduction to the Chronicles of the Cannon Gate where a cockney traveller is represented as trying to efface them with the patent scouring drops, which it was his mission to introduce into use in Scotland. In another of his novels, 
the abbot, Sir Walter Scott alludes to the rizzio of bloodstains, and in his Tales of a Grandfather he deliberately states that the floor at the head of the stair still bears visible marks of the blood of the unhappy victim. In support of these bloodstains, it has been urged that the floor is very ancient, manifestly much more so than the late floor of the neighbouring gallery, which dated from the reign of Charles the Second. It is, in all likelihood, the very floor upon which Mary and her courtiers trod. The stain has been shown there since a time long antecedent to that extreme modern curiosity regarding historical matters, which might have induced an imposture, for it is alluded to by the son of Evelyn as being exhibited in the year 1722. At Condover Hall, Shropshire, there is supposed to be a blood stain which has been there since the time of Henry the Eighth and cannot be effaced. According to a local tradition, which has long been current in the neighbourhood, it is the blood of Lord Nevert, the owner of the hall and estate at this period, who was treacherously slain by his son. But unfortunately this piece of romance, which is utterly at variance with facts bearing on the history of Condover and its owners in years gone by, must be classed among the legendary tales of the locality. One room in Clayton Old Hall, Lancashire, has for years past been nicknamed The Bloody Chamber from some supposed stains of human gore on the oaken floor planks. Numerous stories have at different times been started to account for these blood tokens, which have gained all the more importance from the mansion having, from time immemorial, been the favourite haunt of a mischievous boggart until laid by the parson, and now, whilst ivy climbs and holly is green, Clayton Hall boggart shall no more be seen." In Lincoln Cathedral there are two fine rose windows, one made by a master workman, and the other by his apprentice, out of the pieces of stained glass the former had thrown aside. The apprentice's window was declared to be the more magnificent, when the master, in a fit of chagrin, threw himself from the gallery beneath his boasted chef d'oeuvre, and was killed upon the spot. But his blood stains on the floor are declared to be indelible. At Cotail, a mansion on the banks of the Tamar, the marks are still visible of the blood spilt by the lord of the manor, when, for supposed treachery, he slew the warder of the drawbridge, but these are only to be seen on a wet day. But there is no mystery about the so-called bloody chamber, for the marks are only, in reality, natural red tinges of the wood, denoting the presence of iron. In addition to the appearance of such indelible marks of crime, oftentimes the ghost of the spiller of blood, or of the murdered person, haunts the scene. Thus Northam Tower, Yorkshire, an embattled structure of the time of Henry the Seventh, a true border mansion, has long been famous for the visits of some mysterious spectre in the form of a lady who was cruelly murdered in the wood, her blood being pointed out on the stairs of the old tower. Another tragic story is told of the manor house, which Bishop Pudsey built at Darlington. It was for very many years a residence of the bishops of Durham, and a resting place of Margaret, bride of James the Fourth of Scotland, and daughter of Henry the Seventh, in her splendid progress through the country. This building was restored at great expense in the year 1668, and gained a widespread notoriety on account of the ghost story of Lady Jarrett, who was murdered there. But, as a testimony of the violent death she had received, she left on the wall ghastly impressions of a thumb and fingers in blood for ever, and always made her appearance with one arm, the other having been cut off for the sake of a valuable ring on one of the fingers. One room of Holland House is supposed to be haunted by Lord Holland, the first of his name and the chief builder of the splendid old mansion. According to Princess Mary Lichtenstein in her History of Holland House, the gilt room is said to be tenanted by the solitary ghost of its first lord, who, runs the tradition, issues forth at midnight from behind a secret door, and walks slowly through the scenes of former triumphs with his head in his hand. And, to add to this mystery, there is a tale of three spots of blood on one side of the recess whence he issues, three spots which can never be effaced. Stains of blood, stains that cannot be washed away, are to be seen on the floor of a certain room at Calverley Hall, Yorkshire, and there is one particular flag in the cellar, which is never without a mysterious damp place upon it, all the other flags being dry. Of course, these are the witnesses of a terrible tragedy which was committed years ago within the walls of Calverley Hall. 
It appears that Walter Calverley, who had married Philippa Brooke, daughter of Lord Cobham, was a wild, reckless man, though his wife was a most estimable and virtuous lady, and that one day he went into a fit of insane jealousy, or pretended to do so, over the then Vavasour of Weston. Moneylenders, too, were pressing him hard, and he had become desperate. Rushing madly into the house, he plunged a dagger into one and then into another of his children, and afterwards tried to take the life of their mother, a steel corset which she wore luckily saving her life. Leaving her for dead, he mounted his horse with the intention of killing the only other child he had and who was then at Norton. But being pursued by some villagers, his horse stumbled and threw him off, and the assassin was caught, being pressed to death at York Castle for his crimes. Not only had the stains of this bloody tragedy ever since been indelible, but the spirit of Walter Calverley could not rest, having often been seen galloping about the district at night on a headless horse. And speaking of ghosts, which appear in this eccentric fashion, we may note that Eastbury House, near Blandford, now poured down, had in a certain marble-floored room ineffaceable stains of blood attributable, it is said, to the suicide of William Doggett, the steward of Lord Malcolm, whose headless spirit long haunted the neighbourhood. As a punishment for her unnatural cruelty in causing her child's death, it is commonly reported that the spirit of Lady Russell is doomed to haunt Bisham Abbey, Berkshire, the house where this act of violence was committed. Lady Russell had by her first husband a son, who, unlike herself, had a natural antipathy to every kind of learning, and so great was his obstinate repugnance to learning to write that he would willfully blot over his copy-books in the most careless and slovenly manner. This conduct so irritated his mother that, to cure him of the propensity, she beat him again and again severely, till at last she beat him to death. To atone for her cruelty, she is now doomed to haunt the room where the fatal deed was perpetrated and, as her apparition glides along, she is always seen in the act of washing the bloodstains of her son from her hands. Although ever trying to free herself of these marks of her unnatural crime, it is in vain, as they are indelible stains which no water will remove. By a strange coincidence, some years ago, in altering a window shutter, a quantity of antique copy-books were discovered, pushed into the rubble between the joints of the floor, and one of these books was so covered with blots as to fully answer the description in the narrative above. It is noteworthy also that Lady Russell had no comfort in her sons by her first husband. Her youngest son, a posthumous child, caused her special trouble, insomuch that she wrote to her brother-in-law, Lord Burley, for advice how to treat him. This may have been, as it has been suggested, the unfortunate boy who was flogged to death, though he seems to have lived to near man's estate, Lady Russell was buried at Bisham by the remains of her first husband, Sir Thomas Hobie, and her portrait may still be seen, representing her in widow's weeds and with a very pale face. A mysterious crime is traditionally reported to have some years ago taken place at the old parsonage at Market, or East Lavington, near Devizes, now pulled down. The ghost of the lady supposed to have been murdered haunted the locality, and it has been said a child came to an untimely end in the house. Previous to the year 1818, writes a correspondent of Notes and Queries, a witness states his father occupied the house, and writes that, in that year on feast day, being left alone in the house, I went to my room. It was the one with marks of blood on the floor. I distinctly saw a white figure glide into the room. It went round by the washstand near the bed and disappeared. It may be added that part of the road leading from Market Lavington to Easterton, which skirts the grounds of Fiddington House, used to be looked upon as haunted by a lady, who was locally known as the Easterton Ghost. But in the year 1869 a wall was built round the roadside of the pond, and curiously close to the spot where the lady had been in the habit of appearing, two skeletons were disturbed, one of a woman, the other of a child. The bones were buried in the churchyard, and no ghost, it is said, has since been seen. It would seem also that bloodstains, wherever they may fall, are equally indelible, and even to this day the new forest peasant believes that the marl he digs is still red with the blood of his ancient foes, the Danes, a form of superstition which we find existing in various places. For very many years the road from Reigate to Dorking 
leading through a lonely lane into the village of Buckland, was haunted by a local spectre known as the Buckland Shag, generally supposed to have been connected with a love tragedy. In the most lonely part of this lane a stream of clear water ran by the side of, which laid for years, a large stone, concerning which the following story is told. Once on a time a lovely blue-eyed girl, whose father was a substantial yeoman in the neighbourhood, was wooed and won by the subtle arts of an opulent owner of the manor house of Buckland. In the silence of the evening this lane was their accustomed walk, the scene of her devoted love and of his deceitful vows. Here he swore eternal fidelity, and the unsuspecting girl trusted him with the confiding affection of her innocent heart. It was at such a moment that the wily seducer communicated to her the real nature of his designs, the moon above being the only witness of his perfidy and her distress. She heard the avowal in tremulous silence, but her deadly paleness and her expressive look of mingled reproach and terror created alarm even in the mind of her would-be seducer, and he hastily endeavoured to recall the fatal declaration, but it was too late. She sprang from his agitated grasp and with a sigh of agony fell dead at his feet. When he beheld the work of his iniquitous designs he was seized with distraction, and drawing a dagger from his bosom he plunged it into his own false heart and lay stretched by the side of her he had so basely wronged. On the morrow, as a peasant passed over the little stream, he saw a dark stone with drops of blood trickling from its heart into the pure limpid water. From that day the stream retained its untainted purity, and the stone continued its sacrifice of blood. Soon afterwards a terrific object was seen hovering at midnight above this fatal spot, taking its position at first upon the bleeding stone, but it was ousted by the lord of the manor who removed the blood-tainted stone to his own premises to satisfy the timid minds of his neighbours. But the stone still continued to bleed, nor did its removal in any way intimidate the spectre. Connected with this alarming midnight visitor, writes a correspondent of the Gentleman's Magazine, I remember a circumstance related to me by those who were actually acquainted with the facts, and with the person to whom they refer. An inhabitant of Buckland, who had attended Reigate Market, and became exceedingly intoxicated, was joked by a companion upon the subject of the Buckland shag, whereupon he laid a wager that if shag appeared in his path that night, he would fight him with his trusty hawthorn. Accordingly he set forth and arrived at the haunted spot. The spectre stood in his path, and, raising his stick, he struck it with all his strength, but it made no impression, nor did the goblin move. The stick fell as upon a blanket, so the man described it, and he instantly became sober, while a cold tremor ran through every nerve of his athletic frame. He hurried on, and the spectre followed. At length he arrived at his own door. Then, and not till then, did the spectre vanish, leaving the affrighted man in a state of complete exhaustion upon the threshold of his cottage. He was carried to his bed, and from that bed he never rose again. He died in a week. Similarly, there is a romantic old legend connected with Kilburn Priory, to the effect that there was formerly, not far distant, a stone of dark red colour, which was said to be the stain of the blood of St. Gervais de Mertoun. The story goes that Stephen de Mertoun, being enamoured of his brother's wife, made immoral overtures to her, which he threatened to make known to Sir Gervais, to prevent which disclosure Stephen resolved to waylay his brother and slay him. By a strange coincidence, the identical stone on which his murdered body had expired formed a part of his tomb, and the eye of the murderer resting upon it, adds the legend, blood was seen to issue from it. Struck with horror at this sight, Stephen de Mertoun hastened to the Bishop of London, and making confession of his guilt, demised his property to the Priory of Kilburn. In the same way the Cornishman knows, from the red filmy growth on the brook pebbles, that blood has been shed, a popular belief still firmly credited. Some years ago a Cornish gentleman was cruelly murdered, and his body thrown into a brook, but ever since that day the stones in this brook are said to be spotted with gore, a phenomenon which had never occurred previously. And according to another strange Cornish belief, told of St. Dennis's blood, it is related that at the very time when his decapitation took place in Paris, blood fell on the churchyard of St. Dennis. It is further said that these bloodstains are specially visible when a calamity of any kind is near at hand. 
and before the breaking out of the plague it is said the stains of the blood of St. Denis were seen, and during our wars with the Dutch the defeat of the English fleet was foretold by the reign of Gore in this remote and sequestered place. It is also a common notion that not only are the stains of human blood wrongfully shed ineffaceable, but a curse lights upon the ground, causing it to remain barren for ever. There is, for instance, a dark-looking piece of ground devoid of verdure in the parish of Curdford, Sussex. Local tradition says that this was formerly green, but the grass withered gradually away soon after the blood of a poacher who was shot there trickled down on the place. But perhaps the most romantic tale of this kind was that known as the Field of Forty Footsteps. A legendary story of the period of the Duke of Monmouth's rebellion describes a mortal conflict which took place between two brothers in Long Fields, afterwards called Southampton Fields, in the rear of Montague House, Bloomsbury, on account of a lady who sat by. The combatants fought so furiously as to kill each other, after which their footsteps, imprinted on the ground in the vengeful struggle, were reported to remain with the indentations produced by their advancing and receding nor would any grass or vegetation grow afterwards over these forty footsteps. The most commonly received version of the story is that two brothers were in love with the same lady, who would not declare a preference for either, but coolly sat upon a bank to witness the termination of a duel which proved fatal to both. Savvy recalls this strange story in his commonplace book, and after quoting a letter from a friend, recommending him to take a view of those wonderful marks of the Lord's hatred to duelling, called the brother's steps he thus describes his own visit to the spot we sought for near half an hour in vain we could find no steps at all within a quarter of a mile no nor half a mile of montague house we were almost out of hope when an honest man who was at work directed us to the next ground adjoining to a pond there we found what we sought about three quarters of a mile north of montague house and five hundred yards east of tottenham court road the steps are of the size of a large human foot, about three inches deep, and lie nearly from northeast to southwest. We counted only twenty-six, but we were not exact in counting. The place where one or both the brothers are supposed to have fallen is still bare of grass. The labourer also showed us the bank where, the tradition is, the wretched woman sat to see the combat. Miss Porter and her sister founded upon this tragic romance their story, coming out, or the field of forty footsteps, and at Tottenham Street Theatre was produced, many years ago, an effective melodrama based upon the same incident, entitled The Field of Footsteps. Another romantic tale of a similar nature is connected with Montgomery Church Walls, and is locally designated The Legend of the Robber's Grave, of which there are several versions, the most popular one being this. Once upon a time, a man was said to have been wrongfully hanged at Montgomery, and when the rope was round his neck he declared in proof of his innocence that grass would never grow on his grave curious to relate be the cause what it may there is yet to be seen a strip of sterility in the form of a cross amidst a mass of verdure likewise the peasantry still talk mysteriously of lord derwentwater's execution and tell how his blood could not be washed away deep and lasting were the horror and grief which were felt when the news of his death reached his home in the north the inhabitants of the neighbourhood, it is said, saw the coming vengeance of heaven in the aurora borealis, which appeared in unwanted brilliancy on the evening of the execution, and which is still known as Lord Derwentwater's light in the northern counties. The rushing devil's water, too, they said, ran down with blood on that terrible night, and the very corn which was ground on that day came tinged from the mill with crimson. Lord Derwentwater's death, too, was all the more deplored on account of his having long been undecided as to whether he should embrace the enterprise against the House of Hanover. But there had long been a tradition in his family that a mysterious and unearthly visitant appeared to the head of the house in critical emergencies, either to warn of danger or to announce impending calamity. One evening, a few days before he resolved to cast his lot with the Stuarts, whilst he was wandering amid the solitudes of the hills, a figure stood before him in robe and hood of grey. This personage is said to have sadly reproached the earl for not having already joined the rising, and to have presented him with a crucifix which was to render him secure against bullet or sword thrust. After communicating this message, the figure vanished, leaving the earl in a state of bewilderment. The mysterious apparition is reported to have spoken with the voice of a woman, 
and it is known that, in the more critical conjunctures of the history of the Stuarts, every device was practised by secret agents to gain the support of a wavering follower. It is not difficult to guess at a probable explanation of the ghost of the Dilston Groves. It may be added that at Dilston, Lady Derwentwater was long said to revisit the pale glimpses of the moon, to expiate the restless ambition which impelled her to drive Lord Derwentwater to the scaffold. But how diverse have been the causes of many of these romantic bloodstains may be gathered from another legendary tale connected with Plaish Hall, near Cardington, Shropshire. The report goes that a party of clergymen met together one night at Plaish Hall to play cards. In order that the real object of their gathering might not be known to any but themselves, the doors were locked. Before very long, however, they flew open without any apparent cause. Again they were locked, but presently they burst open a second time, and even a third. Astonished at what seemed to baffle explanation, and whilst mutually wondering what it could mean, a panic was suddenly created when, in their midst, there appeared a mysterious figure resembling the evil one. In a moment the invited guests all rose and fled, leaving the unfortunate host by himself face to face with the enemy. What happened after their departure was never divulged, for no one ever saw that wretched man again, either alive or dead. That he had died some violent death was generally surmised, for a great stain of blood, shaped like a human form, was found on the floor of the room, and despite all efforts the mark could never be washed out. Ever since this inexplicable occurrence the house has been haunted, and at midnight a ghostly troop of horses are occasionally heard, creating so much noise as to awaken even heavy sleepers. And Aubrey, in his miscellanies, tells how when the bust of Charles I, carved by Bernini, was brought in a boat upon the Thames, a strange bird, the like whereof the bargeman had never seen, dropped a drop of blood, or blood-like upon it, which left a stain not to be wiped off. The strange story of this ill-fated bust is more minutely told by Dr. Zachary Gray in a pamphlet on the character of Charles I. Van Dyck, having drawn the king in three different faces, a profile, three quarters, and a full face, the picture was sent to Rome for Bernini to make a bust from it. Bernini was uncountably dilatory in the work, and upon this being complained of, he said that he had said about it several times, but there was something so unfortunate in the features of the face that he was shocked every time that he examined it, and forced to leave off the work. And, if there was any stress to be laid on physiognomy, he was sure the person whom the picture represented was destined to a violent end. The bust was at last finished and sent to England. As soon as the ship that brought it arrived in the river, the king, who was very impatient to see the bust, ordered it to be carried immediately to Chelsea. It was conveyed thither, and placed upon a table in the garden, whither the king went with a train of nobility to inspect the bust. As they were viewing it, a hawk flew over their heads, with a partridge in its claws, which he had wounded to death. Some of the partridge's blood fell upon the neck of the bust, where it remained without being wiped off. This bust was placed over the door of the king's closet at Whitehall, and continued there till the palace was destroyed by fire. End of chapter 6